Um, anyway, I do study love. Uh, I and my colleagues have put over 100 people into the brain scanner. Uh, the first uh, 17 were people who were madly and happily in love. The second were a group of uh, 15 people who had just been dumped, just rejected in love. And the last were people in their 50s and 60s who were still madly in love with their partners. Not just loving them, but in love with their partners. Americans, the world doesn't believe that's true. Uh, you got to pick the right person. And so what I'm going to do is talk about all of that. So anyway, uh, this is what I'm going to do, talk about what love is, rejection of love, love addiction. Uh, I'm on, the only one person in the world that thinks it can be a positive addiction. I can't get the world to believe me on that. Uh, I think it would have evolved for very important reasons. Um, and I want to talk about what makes a happy marriage, what happens in the brain, why you fall in love with one person rather than another. And this is wonderful listening to both Catherine and, and Bianca talking about uh, attraction. And last, uh, what's going on in the world today. So bottom line is um, around the world people love. They sing for love. They dance for love. They have myths and legends about love. They have operas, plays, symphonies, ballets, therapists, TV series, uh, cards, letters, holidays. We are saturated. We are marinated in the world of love. And so I, um, uh, people pine for love. They live for love. They kill for love. And they die for love. It's one of the most powerful brain systems the human animal has ever evolved. And so I began to, by looking at um, cultures around the world, and uh, as it turns out, it can occur at any age. The youngest person I ever met who was madly in love was two and a half. Uh, his mother said, and this is not a sex drive, this is romantic love. Uh, his mother said to me that uh, every single time a particular little girl would come over to his house, she, he would sit right next to her and just stroke her hair. And then uh, he would be upset for about an hour and a half. Uh, after she left. Um, there's no real gender differences. Actually, I've got data on 55,000 Americans. Other people have data on it. Men fall in love faster than women do. Men fall in love more often than women do. Uh, when a man wants to, um, does fall in love, they um, want to introduce that person to friends and family sooner. Men want to move in sooner. And men are two and a half times more likely to kill themselves when a relationship is over. So I've been trying to tell the women's magazines this for 40 years. Uh, they're dedicated to the idea that women are more romantic than men. It's absolutely not true. Uh, I mean, women fall in love certainly just as much as men do. But the bottom line is men are the fragile sex when it comes to love. Uh, uh, I'm not talking gays and straights. Uh, gays and straights uh, both love. I'm not talking about who you're in love with at this point. I'm talking about how you feel when you're in love. And all of my data on gays and straights and trans and the whole pile of them, uh, uh, it's exactly the same. It's a basic brain system. We found it in over 200 societies. And as a result, I began to think this is a universal human experience. I must, there must be something going on in the brain. And in fact, my first academic paper on it one of the uh, peer reviewers said to me, he said, oh no, you can't study love. It's part of the supernatural. And I said, hang on here. Uh, well, you know, anger is not part of the supernatural. Uh, fear is not part of the supernatural. Romantic love can't be part of the supernatural either. So I began to put people in the scanner. Uh, but first of all, these are some of the traits linked with romantic love. I'm going to pile through this because I don't have too much time here. First thing that happens is a person takes on what I call special meaning. Everything about them is special. The car they drive is different from every other car in the parking lot, the house they live on, the street. Everything is special. Uh, then you focus on them. Uh, you can, uh, uh, in fact, before I put the people in the machine, I would ask them, what do you not like about your partner? They can list it, and they sweep that aside and focus on what they do. As Trosser said, love is blind. Uh, indeed, it is. In fact, we've proven that in the brain. Uh, high energy, walk all night, talk till dawn, high euphoria, uh, despair, anhedonia, uh, uh, bodily reactions, um, uh, 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 weak knees, um, butterflies in the stomach, uh, emotional and physical dependence, uh, separation anxiety, you want to be together. I made up this term. Academics of long call talked about frustration, aggression, 
and I think there's frustration and attraction, and there's a good academic articles now that when you don't get the person, when they don't call, when they don't text, when they don't write, you just want them more. Uh, uh, real possession, mate guarding, um, sexual desire, and the three main characteristics of romantic lovers, intense craving. Sure, you want to go to bed with them, but what you really want them to do is to call, to write, to ask you out, to say that they love you. Intensive, um, intrusive thinking, you're obsessed with them. You, you think about them, absolutely. Somebody's camping in your head. They're in their head. Uh, highly motivated to win the person, and it's very difficult to control. As Stendhal once said, the writer, French writer, he said, love is like a fever. It comes and goes quite independently of the will. And indeed it does. So that began to make me think, okay, I can put people in the machine. I do think that um, it's one of three basically different brain systems that uh, evolved uh, during human evolution. They're all the basic mating, um, um, uh, part of the basic human mating strategy and all other am animals, I'd say. Sex drive gets you out there looking for a whole range of partners. You can have sex with somebody who you're not in love with. Romantic love enables you to focus your mating energy on just one at a time. And attachment, that third brain system, enables you to tolerate this person at least, uh, at least long enough uh, to raise a single child together as a team. There's many ways that these three brain systems interact. I don't have time to go into them, but if we can talk about it afterwards, I'm happy to. Um, so I began putting them in the machine. And uh, I was expecting a lot of activity in cortical areas. There is, but they don't all share that. What we found is activity in brain regions linked with drive, in the most primitive parts of, at the bottom of the brain. And as Catherine was talking about, basically activity in the ventral tegmental area. Uh, uh, it pumps out dopamine and sends dopamine to many brain regions, giving you that focus, the motivation, um, the energy of intense romantic love. And what was interesting to me is that lies right next to the hypothalamus, which, or which orchestrates thirst and hunger. Thirst and hunger keep you alive today. Romantic love drives you to form a partnership and send your DNA into tomorrow. And so therefore, we coined the, oop, coined the term uh, it's a survival mechanism. It's a basic human drive. There's a great many emotions involved, everything from jealousy to, to, to fear to anger to all kinds of emotions, but it's a basic human drive that evolved millions of years ago in order to send your DNA uh, into tomorrow. Uh, it lies right near the little yellow arrow is uh, in the hypothalamus, the sex drive. We found activity there. And uh, we found activity uh, also in the, well, no, sorry. Uh, in long-term relationships, you find activity in brain regions linked with attachment. In this case, the ventral pallidum up here. So these are the three basic brain systems that evolved for intense uh, feelings of, of romantic love, sex drive, romantic love, and feelings of deep attachment. So um, it evolved millions of years ago. Um, I could go into... For example, a rat will have a, this response for about uh, half a minute. Elephants will have it for about five days. Uh, human beings can remain in love a uh, very long term. If I had more time, I think I could, I would certainly have many times, trace the ev evolution of it. But I think that the human pattern evolved as we were descending from the trees uh, over 4.4 million years ago. And um, in fact, I was traveling in uh, New Guinea uh, we've evolved along with that the evolution to form partnerships. 97% uh, of mammals do not pair up to rear their young. People do. If a, somebody came down from Mars and said, what was unusual about us, they wouldn't be surprised at our cell phones. They would be surprised that we bothered to pair up at all. And indeed, we do. And what's interesting about that is I was traveling in New Guinea, highlands in New Guinea, and I ran into a guy who had three wives. So I said to him, I said, uh, how many wives would you like to have? And I was thinking, is he going to say five? Is he going to say 10? Is he going to say 25? And he turned around and he said to me, none. No <laughs> wives. <laughs> it can be a toothache. Uh, they tend to um, try to poison each other's children, etc. 86% of world cultures permit a man to have several wives, but we are built to have one at a time. 
Uh, we also divorce. Uh, I have written whole books about it. I'll say very briefly that for millions of years, it was probably adaptive to have more than one long-term partner. Uh, having children by each, you're creating more genetic variety in your young, which led me to believe that the most important thing I could do is not take a look at happy marriages, but look at the people, uh, happy relationships, but at rejection. And I regard that as probably, I mean, this is when people are, have, you know, slip into clinical depression, um, uh, kill themselves, kill others, et cetera, et cetera. So I began to put, so we put um, 15 people who had just been dumped into the brain scanner. And I wanted to prove that romantic love was an addiction, a primary addiction. And indeed, this is what we found, activity in the nucleus accumbens. This is the basic brain region linked with all of the addictions, all of the substance addictions, um, heroin, uh, alcohol, nicotine, uh, et cetera, and all the behavioral addictions, uh, gambling, sex addiction, et cetera. So I've been able to prove that when you're happily in love, the, uh, 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 the um, addiction centers become active, and also when you have been uh, rejected in love. That doesn't surprise me at all. This is what we found for the people who were uh, rejected in love. What's interesting to me is they've, when you're, when you're just been dumped, you're going to keep loving the person. You're going to keep feeling deep attachment for the person. Three brain regions linked with craving and addiction. And what was most important to me is in the nucleus of Cummins, it's associated with not only with the craving, addiction, and risking, but with processing your gains and losses. Academic term. No wonder so many people, when they've been uh, rejected, uh, you're trying to figure out, well, what did I do wrong? And how, who gets the dog and cat? How about the house? What, you know, you're trying to figure out what you've gained and what you've lost. And indeed, the brain is enabling you or driving you uh, to do that. We also found that uh, time heals activity in the ventral tegmental area, like with the oxytocin system, becomes less and less active uh, as, um, as you get farther and farther from that moment of uh, rejection. I think that all three of these basic brain systems can turn into addiction, uh, but that's for another time. So what makes a happy marriage? <laughs> People have been talking about that one forever. Uh, and um, uh, the main uh, psychological things, best known by John Gottman, a friend of mine, probably America's finest psychologist for this stuff, the four courses of the apocalypse are things that you should not do. It's all good. Psychology, it's all good. But this is what the brain says. This is what's happening in the brain when you are in a long-term happy marriage. Oops, sorry. Um, so we put people into the scanner in England, I mean in America, and also in, uh, uh, in um, China, and looked to see what happens in the brain in a long-term, very happy uh, partnership. And indeed, we found activity, as we had expected, in all three brain regions, romantic love, sex drive, feelings of deep attachment, brain region linked with calm and pain suppression. That's a little different from when you've just fallen happily in love. But this is what I wanted to know. I wanted to know about happiness. Psychologists give us all this stuff on happiness. What happens in the brain when you're really in a long-term happy partnership? So when we put these people in the machine, you, you, ask, you ask a lot of, you, you, you get a lot of, of questionnaires before you put somebody in a machine. They're very expensive, as everybody knows. They're very time-consuming. You've got to really prepare the people, et cetera. And um, so um, we took uh, those who scored very high in a happiness scale and looked at their brains. So this is what's happening in the brain in a long-term, extremely happy uh, uh, partnership. All these people were married an average of 21 years. Um, they were all in their 50s and 60s, uh, and most of them had adult children. We found activity in a brain, brain region linked with empathy, a brain region linked with controlling your own stress and your own emotions, and most important to me, I think, a brain region linked with what we call positive illusions, the ability to overlook what you don't like about somebody and focus on what you do. Uh, positive illusion. So um, with that, uh, you got to pick the right person. And this is what uh, Match.com uh, wanted to know. 
I've been working with them for 17 years now. Um, I was the longest played employee. I've gone through eight of their presidents. Um, and um, they came to me and they said to me, why, it was two days before Christmas in New York City where I live. I picked up the phone. They wanted to meet two days after Christmas. Nothing happens in New York City two days before Christmas. I said, sure. I went down to this place. They were piling in. I couldn't figure out who they were. Was I the only academic? Was it a think that what was going on? And as it turns out, it was the CEO on down. And in the middle of the morning, he says, why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, nobody really knows. But we do know some things. Um, we do know that timing uh, is important and proximity. You tend to fall in love with somebody who's around. I would say that lighting, in my case, could have been useful, too. Um, we tend to fall in love with somebody from the same ethnic and socioeconomic background, same uh, level of intelligence, uh, good looks, and education. Certainly, your religious and social values are important. Your reproductive and your uh, economic goals. Uh, we call it a love map. Your childhood always plays a role. Uh, I'm not going to put smell in there. Catherine was very uh, wonderful with that. They don't call it uh, love at first smell. They call it love at first sight. Uh, as she said, a huge part of the brain is, is devoted to sight. And because um, we lived in the trees for so long, you're going to fall out of the trees. Obviously, this is more important than how you smell. Um, um, but I began to think to myself, you can walk into a room and everybody's from your background and level of education and same degree of, ed of good looks and same so social and economic values, and you don't fall in love with all of them. <laughs> Could basic biology draw you naturally to one person rather than another? People will say, well, we have chemistry. What do they mean by we have chemistry? So I began to think to myself, OK, uh, I'm going to go look at the uh, last 50 years of medical and uh, biological literature and see if there's anything that could give me a hint that why we would naturally be drawn to some people rather than others. So I went through lots of academic literature. And as it turns out, there's all kinds of a good uh, 40 to 60 percent of who you are does come out of your biology. I think that both Bianca and, and Catherine have said that very elegantly. And, um, and one example is intimacy. Women, uh, oh, I'm studying uh, temperament rather than culture. Culture plays a role, but I'm interested in your biology. And uh, so I, intimacy is an example of something that seems to be, have a biological basis. Women tend to get intimacy from face-to-face -face talking. We swivel till we face-to-face. -face. We do what's called the anchoring gaze, and we talk. And it probably comes from millions of years of holding that baby in front of your face, cajoling it, reprimanding it, educating it with words. Men tend to get intimacy from side-by-side -side doing. This is in Central Park. I was just walking along. As soon as he looks up, he'll look away. Um, probably comes from millions of years of sitting behind a bush on the grasslands of Africa trying to hit that buffalo in the head with a rock. You can't be yakking with your neighbor as you're doing your job. And as a result, they get intimacy from side by side doing very regularly. And of course, here's the problem. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so bottom line is there's variation uh, in uh, behavior. And indeed, so I went through all the biological literature. I'm not going to go do that now. But the bottom line is, for example, if you give L-DOPA to Parkinson's patients, uh, creativity goes up. Um, uh, gender studies, when you give estrogen replacement uh, to middle-aged women, <clears throat> some linguistic skills uh, become more dominant, et cetera, et cetera. So I went through uh, 50 years of this data looking for any trait at all linked with any biological system. Any bi and as, it, I mean, as both Catherine and Bianca have shown, there's all kinds of uh, systems in the brain. Uh, most of them keep the heart beating or the eyes blinking. They're not linked with any personality trait. But as I kept looking, I found that there were four brain systems that are each linked with a constellation of personality traits, the dopamine, serotonin, testosterone, and estrogen systems. So what I did is I took a sheet of paper 
four sheets of paper and link the traits on each of these four systems. And I thought to myself, I'm going to make a questionnaire to see to what degree you express the traits in all four of these basic brain systems. So I made that questionnaire. It's now been taken by uh, over 15 million people in 40 countries. I then did a second generation questionnaire, which I'm going to give to you during this speech. The only thing about that questionnaire is that it generally costs $300 to take it because it's a business one that I've developed. And as a result, um, if you do want to take it, please take it before Monday night at midnight London time because then it, the link will go dead. Uh, but I didn't mention it to Viviana, but uh, it's just a gift to you. So anyway, the bottom line is uh, uh, because I was working with a dating site, I had to name these people. So I, lousy terms, but uh, uh, I got better ones. But now that 15 million people have taken, I got them stuck with them. The academic <laughs> terms are curious, energetic, social, cautious, social, norm conforming, analytical, tough minded, and pro social, empathetic. Uh, and indeed, uh, we all, a combination of all of them, all of these personality questionnaires that put you in one bucket or another, it's not the way the brain works. Uh, but the degree is uh, there are patterns to nature, patterns to culture, and there's patterns to personality. And that's what interests me, these patterns to personality linked with these four basic brain systems. So what I'm going to do is going to go through just the top one of each one and then show you, in a, I did a study of 28,000 uh, Americans, why we're, who we're naturally drawn to, chemically drawn to. And if I had a huge amount of time, I'd say why. But the bottom line is, here they are. Uh, people who are very expressive of the traits in the dopamine system uh, tend to be uh, novelty seeking, risk taking, this is all in the genetics, uh, sensation seeking, curious, they got the most interests, uh, they make the most money, they also lose the most money because they're so risk taking. Um, <laughs> Uh, exploratory, and then they're not just jumping off bridges and mountains. Uh, they're going to the opera and the theater and liking poetry and coming to a, uh, an experience like this. Optimistic, uh, uh, independent, self-reliant, impulsive. The other ones are walking to the barn, buy everybody a drink. Um, mental flexibility is in the dopamine system, open minus. And the biggest one is idea generation. They are, uh, and I, they have what I call creative intelligence. Now, everybody has it, but some people have it to more than, than others did. Uh, Lang Lang is a perfect example. Uh, uh, Peter Thiel, I'm not going to go through these. Uh, um, daredevil, flair, dazzling, bravado, extremes, ebullient, uh, glorious time. Very different people, very different backgrounds, very different parts of the world, but the same basic biological um, um, sort of creativity and they're drawn to people like themselves. <laughs> Curious, creative, spontaneous, energetic. People want people like themselves. Um, high serotonin people, uh, observing social norms. It's actually, we even know which part of the brain it is. Um, well, we know, I know all the parts of the brain. But anyway, uh, they, they're not scared. Uh, harm avoidant, calm, self-controlled, uh, plans, schedules, orderly. Concrete thinking, literal and detail oriented. And what's interesting about that for me is I was making a speech in, uh, I had made, I'd written a book on this called Why Him, Why Her? And I happened to be in Seattle and I was talking with a journalist and I could tell this woman could not stand me. And not only could she not stand me, but she couldn't stand anything I had to say. And I got more enthusiastic trying to talk her into it. Didn't happen, read what happened in the, she wrote what she wrote the following day in the newspaper. I was convinced I was correct. I was in the taxi cab going back to the airport, and I thought to myself, Helen, you know what this woman was like. Why didn't you just give her the data the way she can hear it? All of the details, the ventral tegmental area, the eigen analysis, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, functional magnetic reference, shower her with details instead of the big picture. And she would have understood me. And at that point, I suddenly realized, I don't believe in the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. I believe in the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would have done unto themselves. Understand who they are. And then you can reach into the brain and, and work with them. And that is actually my next book. 
uh, and I call it hunching, trying to figure out how somebody is, who they are, and then talk to him. Them. You don't have to change what you've got to say, but you've got to say it in the way that they can hear you. So anyway, um, conscient loyalty, it's a huge one. When you see the uh, questionnaire, I can't remember exactly the, the, the way I said, but something, would you rather have loyal friends or interesting friends? This type cannot tolerate unloyal friends. Mathematically, every time I do it, they cannot tolerate unloyal friends. And the other three types cannot tolerate uninteresting friends. Uh, it's a real mathematical uh, divide. And anyway, so uh, Mike Pence, perfect example of that. Um, he must have gone crazy with Trump, but never mind. Uh, uh, Hu Jintao, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth. I mean, I'm sure she thought Diana was a loose cannon on the deck. Um, uh, and these people are also drawn to people like themselves, traditional, conventional, follow the rules, respect authority, detail-oriented, managerial. They want people like themselves, or at least they're drawn to them. Um, high testosterone, um, uh, analytical, logical, this is all, uh, tend to be very good at what we call rule-based systems, math, engineering, computers, music. Music is very structural, uh, 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 experimental, exacting. Uh, rank oriented. If you inject testosterone into a dove or a or a monkey uh, uh, or a lizard, they'll start to fight for rank. Um, it's called dominance matching. Um, happened to me once. What, what they do is they all attack, and they expect you to attack back. And if you don't attack back, they think you're weak. And indeed, I was when I learned my lesson in New York City. I was at a black tie event, and I was standing there with four men. And one of them was a guy from the Wall Street Journal, and he was taking Helen Fisher to the cleaners. He was just taking me out. And the other three were just watching. <laughs> and I, and, I, and I, I got smaller and smaller and smaller. There's two basic postural messages in the entire animal community, looking little and looking big. It's called crouch and loom. And indeed, I was getting smaller and smaller, and all of a sudden, something snapped in my head, and I turned around to this guy, and I said something vicious. And I don't remember what it was, but it was also funny. They all went like this. It's called the barred tooth display. Uh, chimpanzees do it too. You do it when you're nervous. And all of a sudden, I thought, like, ah, if he thinks like a woman, he'll never forget it. And if he thinks like a man, he will respect me. And indeed, they all, and he turned around and he said, hello, and he was so nice. And he's been nice to me ever since. So even the, at plant, at, um, at uh, mash.com, we had one uh, president who, this guy ate rocks for breakfast. He was a nightmare. And, he, and one time he stood on a chair and screamed at us, why doesn't somebody ever push back? Uh, they expect you to. So bottom line is we're not all alike. Uh, um, these are, uh, t they tend to be emotionally contained. Uh, just like, and fairness, fairness is in the testosterone system. Empathy is in the estrogen system. Fairness. But what is fairness but balance? And what is balance but spatial? Uh, and I just find that particularly interesting. So anyway, uh, um, and they're direct. They're the ones where you say, well, you get to the point with them. Uh, Steve Jobs, and you can see it in his face. His face is built by testosterone. The very heavy brow ridge, the psychomatic arch, the high cheek with a square jaw is all built uh, high for, it's all built by uh, testosterone. Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher, I call her the Iron Lady, I think for good reason. Hillary Clinton, what interested me most is when she was asked why she was attracted, why she was attracted to Bill, she said, he wasn't afraid of me. Now, I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, oops, sorry. And they are drawn to their opposite. So dopamine is drawn to dopamine, serotonin is drawn to serotonin, and testosterone is drawn to estrogen. And this is the last of the four. Uh, web thinking, I coined that term. They see the big picture. It probably has to do with the fact that there's more um, uh, nerve connections between the two hemispheres of the brain, and also some uh, data that there's more connections between factories in the back and the front of the brain on both sides. So uh, it gives you, I think, that very broad picture, uh, contextual, holistic, long-term thinking, uh, imaginative, mentally flexible, uh, executive social skills, they are called, 
ability to read posture, gesture, tone of voice, uh, intuitive thinking, theory of mind, that's the term for the ability to figure out who somebody is and, and um, uh, understand them. And last but not least, uh, empathetic and trusting. I put trusting in purple because it finally helped me understand something. And there was an academic article, anthropologists have not figured out why you trust anybody. I mean, what would be the selective thing for that? Um, but if you select, but the academic article said that if you trust the right person, you save a lot of metabolic energy. And indeed, um, I finally understood how they can trust the right person. They think contextually, they read the person properly, they get into their heads, uh, and uh, um, uh, so therefore I began to see how a constellation of personality traits could evolve together. And so, last but not least, uh, uh, their introspective, everything has meaning. Just the way he sliced the lemon at dinner, before dinner for the drinks, means we're not having sex tonight. Everything has meaning <laughs> for the high estrogen type. Um, harmony, they seek harmony. They'll never hit you in the face. Stab you in the back, but never hit you in the face. Uh, a very different way of doing it and emotionally expressive. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is a good example. Bill Clinton, uh, I think we've had our first female president, uh, Bill Clinton. And it feels everybody's pain. Uh, uh, the whole world knows he can't stop talking. Um, and certainly Charles Darwin. Darwin put, connected every living thing uh, in, a, in a magnificent way, of course. And they are also drawn to their opposite. As high testosterone is uh, drawn to estrogen, estrogen is drawn to testosterone. So, um, as I said, I don't believe in the golden rule. Uh, you gotta figure out who people are, and then you can climb into their head and win. So, um, oops, sorry. Um, I think these evolved millions of years ago. You can see them in other animals. And this is my most important slide on this. What I did, uh, I was able to prove that when you take my questionnaire, and I'm going to give you the questionnaire, um, it actually measures brain activity. No other questionnaire in the world can actually validate itself. Because every other one, including the big five, if you're familiar with that, certainly the Myers-Briggs, they're made from linguistic studies to make a questionnaire. And you can't go back to linguistic studies to prove that that questionnaire is actually measuring what it says it's measuring. What I did is I took, went through the brain physiology to make a questionnaire, and then I went on to two brain scanning studies, fMRI, to prove that that questionnaire actually measures what it says it measures. And um, uh, as it turns out, um, if, you take, if, you, if you score high on the traits in the dopamine system, show more activity in a whole dopamine pathways, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I created a question, I created a, um, I did, I, it wasn't my idea, some guy from business called me and he said, you got a great questionnaire, can we make a company? And I do that, I won't go into all that. But um, when you take my questionnaire, if you do, you will get some of this, I won't go into that. And here is um, the URL. And what I'm gonna do is after, um, uh, I finish talking, I'm just going to leave that up so that you can take it if you don't take it now. Uh, but I want to finish by, um, by talking about what's happening today. Um, as I say, I've been for 17 years the Chief Science Advisor to MATCH. And uh, for the last 11 years, what I have done is created a, qu a questionnaire, uh, created about 200 questions. We're doing it this week. Um, and then we, we send it out, and we collect the data on 5,000 Americans. We do not poll the match members. This is a national representative sample of singles based on the U.S. Census. So we got the right number of blacks, whites, Asian, Latino, gay, straight, rural, suburban, urban, every part of the country, and every age group, age 18 to 71 plus. Uh, 71 plus. And indeed, because of that, we've done it, done it for 11 years, so we now have data on 55,000 Americans. Uh, and um, so what I have, and I wrote, just wrote an academic paper on this, 
What, what we're really seeing in America today is something that I call slow love. Um, in my day, I'm in my 70s, uh, people married in their early 20s. Now they're married in their late 20s or even early 30s. We've, what we're seeing is a long period in your 20s of uh, what I call the pre-commitment stage uh, in courtship. Um, and during that period, uh, singles are, um, singles are, uh, um, just got distracted here. Um, sorry. Uh, um, singles are learning more about themselves. Uh, they're learning, they're, they're, having their, they're having their one night stands. They're having their friends with benefits, but they're not tolerating it for long. Uh, I mean, I am crazy about the young. I'm crazy about millennials. You guys are really setting some very interesting uh, faces for the future. But what's most important to me is I went through the demographic yearbooks of the United Nations on 80 societies. And as it turns out, the longer you court and the later you marry, the more likely you are to remain together. And that's exactly what is happening today. And I long thought um, that we're going to, that the, the millennials in this room, you're going to have your affairs, but you're going to marry much later, and by the time you walk down that alley, uh, that owl, uh, that, that owl, owl, thank you, sorry. <laughs> I just got married myself, I'm crazy about them. But anyway, the bottom line is uh, uh, um, you're going to know who you want, you're going to know who you, you got who you want. Uh, uh, Jesus, I'm a little distracted by the conversation, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, the bottom line is, what about the pandemic? So what I ended up finding, uh, our most recent study was last July and August. And it was still much, very much in the pandemic. And indeed, we were anticipating, oh, everybody was saying it's going to be a slutty summer. That I said, no, nah, it's not going to be a slutty summer. And what I really found is that singles have grown up. I call it post-traumatic growth. And I've got thousands of data points to prove it. But I think this is the most important one. In 2019, 58% of singles wanted a partner who wanted to marry. In 2021, 76% wanted a partner who wanted to marry. An 18% rise in people who want to settle down. So this slow love, I don't think they're going to marry any sooner, but they are now interested in a committed partnership. They'll get rid of what they don't want, keep at it, but they, we are... They, we have grown up. Bad boy, bad girl are out. Uh, and singles want a committed partnership. And when I asked, when do you want it? Over 75% want it this year. So they are now in a rush. This, you know, Cupid beat COVID, bottom line. Uh, so anyway, I will finish with this. Um, I think we're moving towards a few decades of relative family stability. I think that the uh, millennials and Gen Z are ushering that in. Um, I think that they'll be much stable, more stable, because that's much longer. So bottom line is there's three things. First of all, slow love, getting the marrying later. The second one is they're meeting on the internet. <clears throat> there's an article out of the University of Chicago that said, if you meet on the internet as opposed to off the internet, internet you tend to be, um, uh, have less divorce. And I thought to myself, why would that be? Well, what if you meet him right here? What if you meet him in a in an airport? What if you meet them at an art museum? What difference does it make whether you meet somebody on the internet rather than off the internet? And today, 40% uh, of, of Americans, anyway, meet on the internet. Only 25% uh, meet through a friend and less than 10% meet in a bar or in a church or whatever. So the bottom line is today, it's the prevailing trend of meeting on the internet. So I did my own study of 5,000 Americans, representative sample, of those people who met on the internet as opposed to off the internet. And as it turns out, the people who meet, people who date on the internet uh, are more likely to be fully employed, more likely uh, to have higher education, and more likely to be looking for a committed relationship. So the bottom line is, not only is love getting slower, it's gonna make it a long, longer distance, they're meeting on the internet, they're gonna have more stable marriages, and of all the things that is most important in today, I think, is women moving into the job market. We say that it's technology that is changing the world. Technology is only enabling us to do the same old thing faster. 
That's all it's really doing is enabling us to get more information faster. The biggest modern trend is women piling into the job market in cultures around the world. And uh, what's really going on is we're moving forward to the kinds of partnerships that we had a million years ago. For millions of years, women commuted to work to gather their fruits and vegetables. They came home with 60 to 80% of the evening meal. The double income family was the rule. And for millions of years, women were just as economically, socially, and sexually powerful as men. Then we began to settle down on the farm. Men's roles became much more important, moving the rocks, selling the trees, plowing the land, bringing the produce up to local markets, and coming home with the equivalent of money. Women's roles became secondary, picking, weeding, pruning, preparing the evening meal, etc. And then we see during the rise of the last 10,000 years, a whole belief system, just as was mentioned earlier, that women uh, uh, were um, not stable, couldn't, uh, weren't economically uh, uh, intelligent, uh, uh, virginity at marriage, uh, till death to us part. You got to, on the farm, who's going to, you can't walk out, uh, and, uh, you know, you can't cut the cow in half and, Leave, you, you ought to leave empty-handed or, or you stick with it. The rise of these constant, the fathers the head of the household, virginity at marriage, women aren't as smart as men, so that's all agrarian belief systems that are disappearing before our eyes. With the really started after World War I, uh, women started to pile into the job market and, they are, and they are, we are moving forward towards the kinds of partnerships that we had a million years ago. So because of these things, three things, I am extremely positive about the future of the family. Thank you.